soldiers of the 101st Airborne Air Assault Division from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, must be ready to deploy within 36 hours anywhere in the world. And they've seen combat just about everywhere. Airborne infantry file into buses for their last landborne ride until D-Day. They fought to support troops landing on the beaches of Normandy. They fought in the jungles of Southeast Asia. And they fought in the desert during the war against Iraq. Now they're preparing for a different kind of mission. Urban combat where casualty rates can be 25% or more. To beat the odds, this battalion from the 101st will spend several days and nights training. An exercise so realistic it will test their strengths and expose their weaknesses in the kind of fight the Army has tried to avoid. The ideal combat situation for us is not in the city. Good day. Hello, sir. Major General John Lemoyne oversees an army task force trying to reduce the dangers of fighting in a city. It tends to get very, very close. Uh, as a result, it gets very brutal and it's very violent. And it tends to be very sudden, unexpected. And it leads to more casualties than fighting on open terrain because a city provides natural fortifications for an enemy. Every building is a sniper's nest. Every intersection, a potential ambush. So in recent years, the military has begun an urban renewal of sorts. Rewriting its doctrine and training manuals and building mock villages like this one at Fort Knox, Kentucky for war games. This is a blow pole where we use explosives to... Andy Andrews, a Vietnam veteran, now a civilian employee for the Army, helped design the site. What's the main premise here? Reality. Training to a standard that we have not been able to reach before by making the city real. There's a railroad, a junkyard, a fake cemetery on the outskirts of town, even a sewer system. And down in here you can see it's wet and it's dirty and we have a, uh, a, an outfit that makes industrial odors for us. Uh, so in this environment, we do employ the correct odor. So you have a working sewer system right down to the smell? Uh, well, we don't put raw sewage in it, but the soldiers aren't sure about that. <laughs> As for the water tower at the edge of town, it's actually the control room for a battery of special effects. Sounds bring the village to life. With the roar of a virtual fighter jet and the blast of pyrotechnics, the town takes on the ominous qualities of war-torn Bosnia or Kosovo. And it's easy to imagine Latin America or towns in Africa or Asia. Is this the Army's premier training facility for this kind of operation? Well, it's the newest. Uh, it is the most intense when it comes to what we're doing. Uh, it covers just about all aspects of possible deployments. Whoa. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I don't want to alarm you, but there's a, there's a building on fire uh, behind th it. Things Whoa. happen once in a while. Take a look at that. <laughs> So the, the soldiers coming in here, they have any idea this pyrotechnics are going to take place? No. It's just, just as, we're, as we're experiencing now is what they experience as they come through here. And of course, this is daylight, <laughs> but they do this at night. They do it day and night. Is it dangerous? Uh, they think it is. Realistically, it's not. Uh, we can't kill them in training. Uh, they know that, but the stress levels that are imposed by many of the things that we do in here gives them the feeling of being in combat. For combat here, the soldiers use blanks in weapons rigged with lasers. 
here and here. Sensors mounted on the soldier's chest and helmet emit a shrill alarm when someone is shot. Aim center mass of his body, fire it, and it goes off. The Army has more than 30 of these urban combat training facilities around the world and plans to build seven more. Despite all the talk these days about future high-tech wars fought by remote control, the Army believes that small-scale conflicts that threaten world security may ultimately draw its troops into the dirty job of taking a city house by house. Go! As the Cold War has given way to regional conflicts and the war against terrorism, U.S. military missions have also changed. Pentagon planners now envision their troops simultaneously delivering humanitarian aid, putting down riots, and engaging in combat, all within one city, possibly within a few city blocks. A new infantry training manual is chilling and blunt. Urban areas are expected to be the future battlefield, and combat in urban areas cannot be avoided. Times have changed. Politics have changed. Right now, our most likely threat is a small-scale contingency, an asymmetric enemy who wants to get us in close so we lose the advantages of most of our uh, high technology. Uh, and they're banking on the American public and the American media for casualty reports uh, to influence our will. In the mock city at Fort Knox, the bad guys are played by 34 soldiers from the 101st, now members of a fictional militia called the Cortina Liberation Front. In the training scenario, the insurgent CLF has captured the town, part of its goal to overthrow the elected national government, which has close ties to the United States. The good guys, 380 soldiers from the 101st, will have to take the town back. Much of the burden will fall on the squad leaders. We're moving 700 meters from LZ Eagle to the wood line. Men like Sergeant Esteban Springer, charged with executing the orders that come from the top. It's really hard. That's why we're training on this level and to training repeatedly over and over we'll get better at it and sergeant matthew hamrick a combat veteran who knows the risks make no mistake we're in a professional business and people die and i don't want it to be my soldiers the ones that die reconnaissance teams will be in two to five man elements over the next four days soldiers from the 101st will draft a battle plan move through the wood line across this phase line practice their moves, go, 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 go. then fight for their lives in the dead of night. Watch out, watch out! In this war game, the emphasis is more on war than game. The skills learned here could mean the difference between life and death if the next mission is real combat in a real city. Right here, right here. Coming up, Hey, up against the wall! The fatal funnel. Can these soldiers make it through alive? Let's go, sir! We have a saying, uh, fight the enemy, not the plan. You know, they're not going to play by our rules. Before the battle, troops from the 101st trained to survive the fatal funnel. The fatal funnel is that point where you go into the room, one meter into the room, one meter on each side of your entry point. Hey, up against the wall! Go, go, go! If you got a bad guy in there, he's the one that will be oriented at the fatal funnel. Every soldier is going through that thing to get into the room. The only way to make it through alive is teamwork. Each soldier is responsible for a section of the room. They're not in there together, 
the first guy that goes in there doesn't have anybody to cover him when, he's in, when he enters the room. And that, that's a problem there. Sergeant Matthew Hamrick has seen urban combat firsthand. As an elite Army Ranger, he was part of the 1989 invasion of Panama to topple General Manuel Noriega and arrest him on drug trafficking charges. Anytime you're in a situation people shoot at you, I would expect anybody would feel fair. I don't know how I deal with it. I mean, it's just something I guess the Army trained me to deal with somehow in their collective way of thinking, the way they train people, I don't know. Now with the 101st Airborne, Hamrick helps lead Charlie Company, training his men to kick the Cortina Liberation Front out of the mock embassy at Fort Knox, the biggest building in town. By virtue of his experience, Hamrick has carved out a special niche for himself. I don't know how to say this without uh, letting my commanders way up there see how I do business. I, I have basically had picked my squad. And I have willed and dealed with other squad leaders, and I have built my squad up to the powerhouse that I think we are today. We got heads up there. Hey, 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 flank. The newest squad member is Private Michael Gonzalez, 18 years old, fresh out of basic training. Gonzalez joined the Army for excitement. I'm adventurous. And I like a uh, somewhat adrenaline rush. If you're efficient at what you do, then the danger level isn't that high, if you're good at what you do. But Gonzalez is impulsive. Anxious to do a good job and learn to do it better, his commander says Gonzalez sometimes works too quickly. Clark. For example, checking for booby traps on enemy dead. Do it the wrong way, someone gets killed. Sometimes I just go too fast. I guess it's just the adrenaline trying to just do it, you know. For three weeks now, I've been trying to get that through him, and he's picking up on it now. I try to do efficient, but yet yeah, uh, fast. It's not something you can learn overnight. Not overnight, but the sooner the better. Because urban fighting is taking on a new importance in the Army. It's a major shift from the mindset of the Cold War. During the Cold War, the focus was on warfare on the plains of northwestern Europe. That urban terrain has taught us a great deal about adapting. Russell Glenn is a military analyst at RAND, a West Coast think tank. He says that when Cold War tactics were applied to Desert Storm, the lesson was clear. You probably can't beat the U.S. on open terrain. Open terrain allowed us to engage them with weapon systems that gave us superior reach. We had systems that could reach out and kill them at the ranges where they could not kill us. But two and a half years later, the world learned a different lesson as U.S. troops confronted anarchy in Somalia. What began as a humanitarian relief mission turned into a manhunt for combative faction leader Mohammed Farah ID. During a raid by U.S. Special Forces, Somali fighters on the ground with what U.S. intelligence believes was help from Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda network, shot down two Army Black Hawk helicopters. In the ensuing gun battle, the worst firefight since the Vietnam War, 18 U.S. soldiers were killed, 73 others wounded. Hundreds of Somalis were killed and wounded as well. Somali crowds dragged the bodies of U.S. soldiers through the streets. In response, the White House claimed it would not cut and run, but immediately began planning for the withdrawal of U.S. troops within six months. And some of the Pentagon believe Osama bin Laden concluded the U.S. military could be defeated simply by inflicting casualties. Certainly somebody 
looking at that sweet, sweet. would say that the United States and its potential allies were not as ready to fight in built-up areas as they were in more open terrain. On the rail. Sergeant Esteban Springer understands the lessons of Somalia, and as a squad leader in the 101st Alpha Company, he is responsible for the lives of eight men. Somebody's got to do this job, and I feel that I'm competent enough and trained enough to where I'm doing a good job at it. At the Fort Knox training site, Sergeant Springer and Alpha Company will attack the hotel. Strategically important, because it overlooks the main street. Pick it up. Start pushing up. You have to train like you fight. Springer's men have traced out the rooms of the hotel. They rehearse their moves in preparation for the mock battle. They can run drills over and over. And if you make split decisions at a moment's notice while you're training, then in combat you'll be able to make these decisions also. There you go. Then you just pick up. It's a tight uh, working environment. You're inside a building. You want to maintain 18 inches off the wall because bullets could glance off the wall and hit you. So smooth. You want to be able to be right next to each other and then you go into your motion into the room. You guys will come out, then you just pry it off around this corner here. It's like you're flowing into the room itself from the hallway. And then you come in and move into your zone of domination. The training starts at low intensity, so newcomers like Private Anthony Guyton can keep up. You're going to have to be clearing the steps, all right? just like that. Guyton joined the Army eight months ago to escape a poor neighborhood in Queens, New York. Just like everyday ghetto environment, urban, bad stuff, hanging out late and stuff like that. Guyton views the Army as an opportunity to build a career. I actually picked up Guyton at battalion headquarters when he first came to the unit. He seemed like the model soldier out of basic training. Yes sergeant, no sergeant, standing at parade rest. Got the big open air. Right. What Guyton resists is the squad's unofficial pastime, chewing and spitting. Oh, never. <laughs> I'm a city guy. I tell him all the time, I say city people don't chew no tobacco. Forget that. Nah. No, never. Down the, hall. Be down the hall. But their differences haven't diminished the loyalty Guyton feels to the other men. They're responsible for each other's lives. It's a bond you, you meet just instantly. Whereas even when I was home, like the people I grew up with all my life, we, we never had that bond. I love these guys. I love my family. I'm willing to die for these guys. This is what I'm willing for my family. Go. Like come in. Entering and clearing a room, each soldier has a specific assignment. Guyton knows he could be called to work any position in the event a comrade falls in battle. If you practice, you can always make up for your mistakes. And if you do it for real in war, any time for mistakes. A mistake can cost you your life. When we return. The Cortina Liberation Front digs in for a fight. This is going to be our most casual producing weapon right here. The bad guys are digging in for a fight. 34 soldiers from the 101st are playing the enemy, the Cortina Liberation Front. The more experienced have learned from previous war games how to use the urban environment to their advantage. Right now we're just trying to move cars around the area. It's just um, something big, heavy, and it, you see it's hard to move unless we have a forklift, so they're not going to be able to move it. Even though the opposition force is outnumbered 11 to 1, it can still inflict heavy casualties. What it is, is just a barrier just to slow them down. So it's kind of a trap? You're trying to route them in one place? So yes. You can ambush them? Yeah, that's a term you can actually use to ambush them, to slaughter them. The exercise is instructive to soldiers on both sides of the fight because it forces them to think like the enemy 
they may someday confront in a real city. Is this wired up with explosives or just wired up so nothing opens and closes? Wire. Well, we're going to put the explosives on the doors too. Okay. All those little things we made. All right. Coming through as a platoon into a building like this, every turn you turn, there's something there. We're going to have to put something on the elevator. You have to be on your toes at all times, and every corner you turn around, there could be someone there. There could be a mine there, so you got to watch yourself and your buddy. I may give you back a sniper team in the platoon, all right? The battalion commander from the 101st, Lieutenant Colonel Ricky Gibbs, actually wants a tough fight to pinpoint his unit's strengths and weaknesses. If we cover them up, we don't know, and we, then we go into combat, and then we're in trouble because we really don't know what we need to fix, and we're not a better trained outfit. And that's the way I want you to fight it. I want Gibbs to fight even it. tips off the opposition force to his battle plan to make it harder for his own troops. And I see the, this thing going with the two big fights being here and here. Right now we're just trying to barricade the downstairs. There you go. So they're going to have problems getting upstairs. <laughs> Once they get into the wire, they're going to have problems themselves. Unroll those and put those down in there. We're the only ones that knows where everything's at, so they're going to be running around, turning a corner, and they realize they can't get there, and hopefully they'll bunch up, and then we'll have uh, people in uh, good spots with uh, good shots. The opposition force can fight dirty. It doesn't have the same rules of engagement that govern U.S. soldiers. So anything goes. I set a booby trap on this mine right here. So they, they pull it out at night, and it blows them up. Bump the car. This trap uses an illegal anti-personnel mine. Our United States Army isn't using it anymore, except in Korea, because of the landmine convention. But since we're the enemy, we can use it. The high explosive weapons used in training are simulations made with fireworks or flares. Grenades. Grenades works good too. We have uh, mannequins that you can see around the buildings, and hopefully they change their plan and try to attack those positions when actually we're not there. For the op force to prevail, what would have to happen? Well, I think the probably if they rush. If they rush too much, they'll run into buildings without thinking through their tactics. Surprise is the key. Anytime we can uh, make them think or change their plan, it's uh, an asset to us. I've been in command about 10 months now. And in the 10 months I've been in the battalion, we have not gone into a big city like this to fight. Move out, move out. We've done a lot of how to enter and clear a room, or how to enter and clear a building with only two rooms. More silence. Silence, silence. Watch your tower behind you. This is probably, say, graduate level work. One of the toughest lessons will come from this 50 caliber machine gun. They don't think we have rounds for it, but we got some. We got much, but it don't take much. The opposition force is putting the gun in Andy's restaurant with a clear shot at the embassy across the street, the tallest, most strategically important building in town. This is going to be our most casualty producing weapon right here. The battle will begin later that night. Cold Steel 6, Bulldog 6, I understand you said you cleared the third floor of Building 12, or? After three days of training, Lieutenant Colonel Ricky Gibbs sets up a command center in the rain-soaked woods outside of the town. He's about to find out how he and the men he leads might fare in a real battle. All right, good. The 101st wants to fight in darkness to take advantage of its sophisticated night vision equipment. Condor 6, Mad Dog 6, I need to know when you fire the missile to take out the power station. Over. Shortly after 9 p.m., using the magic of Hollywood special effects, a virtual Apache helicopter begins the attack. By hitting the electrical substation, all the power in town is shut down. 
except for a couple of emergency lights in the embassy. But the Cortina Liberation Front sends up flares so that it too can see in the night. The American force counters with smoke bombs to hide its movements on the ground. Several miles away at a makeshift airfield, Chinooks and Blackhawks carried the troops from the 101st to their assignments. Even though we know it's pretend, it doesn't feel pretend. We look at everything as if it could be real. The plan is for Charlie Company to move from the landing site through the woods that surround the town and attack the embassy from behind. The soldiers want as much cover as possible because most casualties occur getting into buildings. The opposition force is prepared. Let them breach that wire. Y'all stand in the hallway. Reload! Reload! You're going to get the fight? Roger, sir. Come on. Let's go. The bad guys have surrounded the embassy with concertina wire. Not impenetrable, but cutting it takes time. I was thinking before, you know, it's just another training exercise, you know. But when you're actually doing it, your heart starts racing. And my, my knees started shaking a little bit. Charlie Company blows a hole in the wall to enter the compound. It's safer than climbing over the wall like they'd done in training the day before. They're breached on one! Inside, the battle is intense. I knew the bullets weren't real. But still, the whole idea of, of just doing what we had to do, it was scary, it was a little scary. There's a big concern for fratricide in these units. Even going in a single room, if people don't go to their sector, you've got bullets flying past people's head to engage targets. That's how that's how dangerous it is. One, two, three. When the building has been captured after a one-hour firefight, Charlie Company reports that the attack went virtually as planned. One six wounded in Charlie. Two KIA. Did Roger understand uh, you had 16 wounded and uh, two KIA over? With control of the three-story embassy, Charlie Company can now support the troops who will attack the other buildings. You need to cover Andy's top floor. Gonzalez is anxious to help, but the first thing he does is wrong. He heads to the balcony. It's dangerous because there's not enough cover. Gonzalez. Get in here. His supervisor pulls him to a supposedly safer place. There was a metal container guarding uh, three-fourths of the window, and I had a little section I was shooting out of. But it's not thick enough to stop rounds from a 50 caliber machine gun, like the one the opposition force set up across the street. Oh, hell no. At first, I was like, oh, dang, I'm dead. But then I started thinking about, I was like, I would really be dead right now, blood and the whole nine yards. And you kind of have to deal with that your own little way. It turns out the new position for Gonzalez was no safer than the first one. I think Gonzalez was a casualty because of our, <laughs> not of my team leaders where we positioned him. His body is pulled out. I take responsibility for that, yes. The others pull back. Hey, Lance. Yeah. Hey, work your way out of here. While Charlie Company takes the embassy. Let's go, let's go first. Let's go. Alpha Company is getting ready to attack the hotel.
while Charlie Company attacks the embassy. The plan for Alpha Company is to come through the junkyard and attack the hotel. Prepare to launch uh, my first assault platoon into the breach, over. Hey, let's push. Let's go. Let's go first. Let's go. Let's go. While one platoon strikes first to clear a path. All right, get a move on right now. I got permission to go. The others stay behind. Seemed like a long wait, but we, like we train for that too. That's where the mental part comes in. Private Guyton carries a folding ladder, unaware he is about to play a key role. I was expecting to get to where we had to go and leave it off for the next company who was behind us, or the next platoon who was behind us. And then the mission changed, like, instantly. It's like, oh, man. When his team gets the signal to move forward, Guyton and the others learn that the first floor of the hotel is too heavily barricaded to enter. To get in a window on the second floor, they need the ladder. It was halfway open because I was running with it. And then we stopped and everybody's like, oh, get the ladder open, get the ladder open. And I'm like, oh, shit. And like, I, I wasn't shown how to get it open. I was just told to carry it and drop it off. There's gunfire from across the street. Sergeant Springer, who is supposed to lead his squad, we got a squad leader down. is one of the first casualties. I was pretty upset, actually. So I felt that I failed my squad by being assessed as a casualty, unable to help control the two fire teams. His next in command takes over. I felt that I let them down by doing that, and just everything was not going according to the plan. Let's go, let's go, let's go, hurry up! Come on, come on, come on! When they get the ladder open, they discover it's too short. So the guys were actually having to jump from the ladder to the windowsill, and then there was another man in the windowsill help pulling them in. Hey, Maxine, Maxine. Finally, inside the hotel, they confront the opposition force head on. We know that. Let's go, let's go. Get in there. Alpha Company slowly takes control. Are you in the lead up there? Everybody but Weeks, get out of that room. They mark each room after it's cleared, a signal that it's secure. Alpha Company sustains about 25% casualties, one out of four injured or killed. The Army says that's typical of urban combat. Considering the problems they had getting into the building, Sergeant Springer says it could have been worse. Come on, let's go! They actually entered and cleared the rooms still, even when they took casualties. They formed up into four-man teams and still continued to do what they were trained, the way that they were taught. So that was great. They did that on their own to a T. With the main building now under their control, a third company, Bravo Company, mops up. Only scattered pockets of resistance are left. Pretty much, from the looks of it, we're it. We're, we're the only thing that's left of the so-called bad guys. So we're probably just going to run around until we either run out of ammo or they kill us. Go! Get out of here! Not a whole bunch more we can do. Five hours after the battle started, the good guys have taken over the village. All right, lift it up. But only after losing 58 of their men. When we return... Congressmen and senators are going to be invited to visit this site. Senior State Department officials will visit these sites. And it's quite easy to develop the impression in your own mind that you're better at this than you are.
The battle-weary soldiers have spent the night in the buildings where they fought. Right out here, mate. The overall casualty rate was 15 percent, better than anyone expected. This will be a day to reflect on what went right and what went wrong, lessons that might be needed on a future urban battlefield. I think overall, the overall fight was faster than what we anticipated and we were able to get through the town. We were taking bets on how long it would take to take this town down. And uh, it went from 1 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning. And we finished the fight and destroyed the enemy about 2 o'clock. But the training is not quite over. In the building, you're safer than any place else. And what we were doing was we were outside just standing around. Soldiers from each unit meet to critique themselves. Alpha Company meets in the lobby of the hotel, now their hotel. Private Guyton, Sergeant Springer, and their platoon leader, Lieutenant Al Snyder. I'll tell you one thing, this is, this is a perfect opportunity just to look back. How many new guys we got here? First field problem. All right. What did you use to mark the rooms to clear them? There's no top brass, just the guys who pull the triggers. As they analyze the battle from the previous night, they can see how small problems combine to create big ones. At the beginning, there was incomplete information from the first group to attack the hotel. Communication stopped. The CEO, the commander, thought that the breach was secure when it wasn't. As a result, the next group was called up too early, Sergeant Springer's group. I think if we would have waited probably another 20 minutes, we would have done a lot better going into the building. Rushed from the beginning, things only got worse when they needed the ladder. This right here, pull up! Hey. The only thing that we lacked on rehearsing was actually employing the ladder itself. You pull us up, pull us up. And when we got here, we didn't have the ladder fully employed all the way. Pull that up. Hey, what up with the goddamn? That was initiative when we went up that ladder, okay? We'll get better, and that's why we train. The training has taken on new urgency in the wake of the September 11th attacks. Move it, come on! Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has ordered his commanders to draw up plans to take the war against terrorism to other countries. Some in the Pentagon want to go back to Baghdad and remove Iraqi President Saddam Hussein from power. Also under consideration, a return to Somalia, where Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda network is believed to still be operating. Missions that, in all likelihood, would require fighting in cities. It is not our intention to reduce cities to rubble uh, while they hide in there. We will find clever ways to go after us, but, but it's extremely difficult. Very few people know of any more difficult kind of warfare. But if cities are such horrible places to fight, why not just avoid them? There are times you're going to say, this particular piece of property is important to us. We want that airfield. We want that seaport. Uh, we want that rail junction. We want that tunnel or that bridge. And if that's in a city, then go get it and then hold it. By the year 2030, 60% of the world's population will live in cities, many of them rife with the conditions that breed political instability. The world today is more urbanized. The focus of national diplomacy, of national politics, of, in many cases, military strength, are in built-up areas. We're not going to necessarily be able to pick and choose where we want to fight or when, and certainly not who. Um, and if they're smart, and most of them are, they'll look for any advantage that they can find. That advantage often lies in a city. as soldiers who train for the fight quickly learn. But while the intensity is a sobering experience for the participants, some experts worry that the realistic training may be confused with the real thing. MIT professor Barry Posen is a specialist in U.S. military policy. Congressmen and senators are going to be invited to visit this site. Senior State Department officials will visit these sites. 
And it all looks very can-do. And as we, our army knows how to do this. And that's true. They will know how to do it as well as it can be done. And it's quite easy to develop the impression in your own mind that you're better at this than you are. For now, the Army is pushing for more urban training, especially with units like the 101st that are among the first to deploy to a conflict. This is the way of the future. We fought in the jungles, we fought in the desert, and now it's a new place to fight. Even after leaving the mock village at Fort Knox, the 101st urban training continued at other sites. Top officers say that with the additional training they've had in recent weeks, they are ready, more than willing, and confident they can do the job.